Hello and welcome to the Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things that are beautiful and useful. My name is Anushka and you can find me elsewhere online as a sour telling, that's a sour telling. And that is my username on Instagram and on Ravelry as well. So happy December to everybody. Um, this video is being released for the 24th of December, which is Christmas Eve. And I know that for many European viewers, this is the festive day for you guys. And for English and North American viewers, you probably celebrate on the 25th of December instead. And also I just want to give a little shout out for those of you who do not celebrate Christmas either as a religious festival or a secular holiday but instead are just hopefully having the opportunity to have some downtime um, whether you have already celebrated different religious holidays or not whatever is the situation for you. So I just wanted to mention that um, up front. So show notes for this episode as well as all of my videos as usual can be found in the down bar here on YouTube so do click on the little pointy arrow to spring forth the information box. And um, this is obviously my kind of Christmas um, episode but I it's going to be it's going to be business as usual very much just with extra kind of extravagance <laughs> even more extravagance than normal and i'm recording this on december the 23rd and i'll be releasing this on the 24th um and i'm hoping that you guys you know um obviously this period of time is different for different people some people might be hosting many large gatherings and kind of rushing about and for you i hope that maybe you, you manage to take some time out relax kick back watch a few podcasts and for other people um, it's more about kind of um, taking taking a step out of normal normal routines maybe you're doing a lot of traveling um, maybe you you know you've got a lot of quiet moments in which to enjoy craft and podcasts and maybe you've got some um, long journeys in which you want to watch some stuff so just wanted to say um, hello to everybody whatever you're up to let me know um, what you're up to actually and um, yeah, what you're doing whilst watching in this late December video. Mm. So I've got to admit that I am feeling completely spaghetti brained at the moment. Um, I feel like I've got a million things to do. There's just no way that I'm going to get everything done. Um, but I wanted to record a podcast for you guys. And I was going to give a shout out to the sun, <laughs> which has just come out after days and days and days of what has felt like incessant rain during the day and during the night and um, for anyone following along on my vlogmas series um that's been quite an issue chez moi because um we basically had a leak in the roof which we tried to patch up but basically it then continued to rain so much that the rain just burst through our repair and obviously in order to get roof is in it has to be a period of dry weather so sort of every day I'm, I'm staring at this watermark on the ceiling with fingers crossed that nothing basically nothing's going to happen because no news is good news when it comes to leaks as far as I'm concerned um but yeah I'm recording this video now even though the sun is coming out and that means it's going to blow the video out and spoil my indoor lighting because actually overcast days are best for recording um but I'm just so happy to see the sun <laughs> Um, I just mentioned Vlogmas and for anyone that um, has not been on YouTube or, or has missed any videos, you know, for whatever reason that might be, um, I decided to join in on Vlogmas for about 10 days. Um, Vlogmas is a video challenge that a lot of people in the knitting, sewing and craft uh, podcast online communities partake in in which you aim to upload a, a video a day up till the 25th of December and I decided to do it from the 10th until about the 22nd of December and I've decided to put it on a pause. Um, so for anyone who's looking for extra entertainment content there's a link on screen now and below this video to access my Crimson Vlogmas playlist. Um, 
And also I just want to give a little mention to my last podcast episode uh, 19, as well as recent helpful videos that I have uploaded, how to knit faster and how to take your knitting to the next level. So recent videos, again, I'll put links down to those below this video here on YouTube, because I think that um, it's possible that those might have been missed given the kind of onslaught of Vlogmas videos. So if you're looking for some extra entertainment, if you want to hear more from me rambling slash giving advice, <laughs> everybody is very gracious about my videos and my advice videos which is which is really sweet and, and so great to have the feedback so um, again a big thank you to everybody who has commented who has sent me messages who has reposted about my videos on YouTube or on Instagram or on Ravelry and kind of generally spread the word about the Crimson Stitchery I'm truly truly grateful um, we live in a world now run by algorithms and social media and whilst there is in theory an um, equality of um, kind of opportunity for access for all in practice um, it's you know the online world very much reflects the offline world in that it's about who you know it's about getting the word out there it's about networking and it's very much thanks to the enthusiastic reception of all of my viewers that my um, podcast The Crimson Stitchery this channel has taken off in the way that it has and I'm so happy to um, have nearly 3,000 subscribers. Um, before I started this YouTube channel in the past I have written a blog and at different times in how the internet has gone the blog has been quite successful or completely stagnant you know kind of depending on the trends of, of being online but even when my blog was really successful and I had like a lot of comments and a lot of feedback and sort of opportunities coming my way um, I never had nearly 3,000 subscribers it was it was probably a thousand at most I mean I guess there were less people online um, but the kind of level of interaction and feedback that I was getting has, has never matched what I'm getting on YouTube. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's, really, it's really meaningful. And I will say um, up front, you know, this is kind of the last video of the year, um, but it's not, it's not even been a year yet because I started this channel in February last year. Um, just kind of drink, drinking some English breakfast tea um, <laughs> as, I, as I ramble on to you. Um, but yeah, it's not even been a year yet, and I think before I started this channel, I watched a lot of videos on YouTube and I followed different kind of craft and knitting influencers, if you will, on Instagram, and I could never really understand it when people would sort of ramble on and on and say, oh, you know, thanks so much to all of my viewers and da 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 da, da. And maybe it was the cynic in me or, or I, I don't know, like I, I guess I felt like because as a viewer I was never, I was never very active if I'm honest with you. I wasn't as good as all of you guys are at commenting and getting in touch and all of that kind of stuff. I just kind of let things play and, and did my thing, but I enjoyed the content and engaged with it um, kind of myself, just not kind of, um, in a more outward way and I, I never really realised what it meant when um, content creative were giving these these messages of thanks um, but now I'm on the other side it's kind of like yeah you might hear someone say you know speak out and say oh thanks so much to everyone that's viewed and you might think oh well they're not talking about me they're probably talking about their like really engaged fans the people that are really active and commenting and, and so on and so forth and yes obviously it is those people because you can you know you've got a name there's a username as a profile photo you kind of know who they are um some of my really engaged followers have also um, supported me financially through this channel, either by buying me coffees on Ko-fi or by buying my knitting patterns, um, whether or not you've knit them, which again is another thing to be thankful for. Ooh, just spiking myself on my Christmas tree. Um, <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is, when I say thank you, it really is to everybody. And even if this is like the first time that you are clicking onto one of my videos, um, you're intrigued by this lady in red, um, it, 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 it's not trite, it is meaningful. I really do mean it. Thank you so much for tuning in and for continuing to. Okay, that's been a really, really long intro. Um, just a few last things to say. Um, I do send out a monthly newsletter in the first few days of every month, you know, normally around the second or third of the month. So please do subscribe to that if you haven't done so already, if you want a little injection, injection of the Crimson Stitchery into your inboxes at the beginning of every month. 
and um, that's why you'll get you know the first news about any updates and releases and so on and also you'll get my writing and photography and kind of thoughts to you directly um i've thought about you know doing a blog and i've decided against starting a blog and instead what i do is i write this newsletter basically so if you want a little bit more from me please do sign up to the newsletter link below it's free i uh, won't spam you i promise um and then the next thing i want to mention is the ravelry group so now we're moving into craft and knitting the Crimson Whiplong has been running for the last couple of months. This is a community initiative which was running from about the middle of August up until the end of the year. Um, so the end is approaching now. So I've decided to open a finished objects thread early um, on the Ravelry group because like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I don't know what everybody's schedule's like. The Crimson Whiplong is running till the 2nd of January. Um, and then there will be basically an extra week after that until let's say that let's round it up and say um, yeah like the 9th or 10th of January um, in which to post in if you have succeeded in completing 50% of your finished of your works in progress <laughs> over the last couple of months if you've managed to clear 50% of your whip pile including new cast ons so that finished objects thread will be open for those people the chatter thread um, will continue to run until the 2nd of January at which point I will close it um, and I will open a whip along stragglers thread so we will still have somewhere to chat um, but I just kind of want to move the focus away from the whip along coming into January because I've got lots of ideas about different kinds of crimson stitchery projects that I'd like to get going so anyway um, if this is ringing a bell if you thought oh yeah I entered a list on the um, crimson whip along I was meant to do something with that you know feel free to go back check through what you've done and if you've managed to finish 50% or more of the whips and tick them off your list then please do post on the whip along winners thread or I, I don't know I'll, I'll think of something but if you hope, hop over to the Ravelry group um, you will see that there. The second thing on the Ravelry group is that I'll open a thread, um, a Q&A thread. So if there's um, a burning question that you have to ask me, I'm going to be doing a Q&A episode for my one year anniversary. Even just saying that is so surprising. Um, so you can just feel free to start adding things in there. And then that is a very nice and static place for me to access those questions. So I'm aware that a lot of people don't use Ravelry that much anymore. You might prefer Instagram, you might prefer YouTube, you might prefer Facebook. And we had a really nice discussion about this in one of the earlier episodes of Crimson Stitchery. Um, I've decided to continue using Ravelry and also encourage other people to do so, literally because it's slower, because the the website function is a little bit out of date it still uses forums whereas other other most of the websites have gone to discussion threads and algorithms and reactive feeds and all of the rest of it but Ravelry is a lot slower and from my perspective it just makes it easier to search for and access information in a way that is almost impossible on Instagram and in a way that is very different to YouTube so Ravelry is a great way of accessing written down information essentially so as far as I'm concerned and for things like yeah like asking for feedback on the video it's quite helpful to have like a labeled thread on Ravelry that is searchable that I can use keywords for um, because when people make suggestions on videos on YouTube in the comments I do actually take note of those I add them to a spreadsheet but if I kind of think oh yeah what was that thing that that person said it, it can be a bit hard to find where kind of physically find where it is whereas Ravelry's got a good search function and it's one of the main strengths of the website amongst others so yeah, hop over to the Ravelry group, check out the whip along and um, start entering your finished items if, if that is you, or add a question if you have one to the list. Right, let's start talking about what's in my knitting basket. My knitting basket is looking pretty full. So first off, I whipped up, pun unintended, I whipped up a last minute Christmas present, which is a washcloth. Um, and it's done, it's one of those kind of dishcloth patterns where you do yarn overs at the edge to increase it and then you do yarn overs and double double the decreases in order to still get the holes. Um, and I did it in moss stitch um, because I think it's going to be a lovely texture to have as a flannel to kind of slightly exfoliate and I need to pop to the shops and buy a nice bar of soap and I will wrap up this cotton washcloth with a bar of soap and that was a last minute Christmas present to 
a really important family member <laughs> that um, I'm kind of ashamed to say that I forgot I forgot to make them a present until my aunt said to me, what are you giving, what are you giving for so-and-so? I was like, oh no, <laughs> how could I forget? They're like really, really generous and considerate and I clearly am not. But anyway, I managed to knit this in, in half a day and it's just knit with some DK bright red cotton from my stash. Um, I wanted the washcloth to be in pure cotton. So yeah, luckily that's been really quick. And I think that wrapped up with a bar of soap, it's gonna be a really lovely gift. And I know that the recipient is gonna really um, enjoy the fact that I have knitted something for them. So bad, <laughs> bad girl, sorted it out. So yeah, that's kind of, um, it was a little bit scrumpled up. So I just sprayed it with water and left it to dry in a damp towel next to the radiator. So it wasn't a proper blocking. Um, it was just enough to just slightly relax the fibers. Um, next up in my knitting basket, I've been really busy to be honest with you, is my two, what are my two samples, one's blocked and one's unblocked, and I'm just holding them back here because basically this is my Sagittate cowl knitting pattern, and I had wanted to release this in December, but I just decided that I would release it in January instead. I just thought I released the birch ply socks a couple of weeks ago. Thank you for the reception of that. It's been so exciting to see people's cast-ons. Really, really fun. Um, and I wanted to do two patterns in December, but um, yeah, just didn't work out. So I thought I'll leave it for January and I will talk more about it hopefully next episode. But this hot pink yarn um, was yarn support provided by Layla of the Urban Pearl. And it's just so vibrant, rich, very, very slightly um, kind of variegated. She calls it her tonal semi-solid, I think, yarns or semi-tonal yarns. Um, and there's just kind of just enough, just enough there to give it some interest and make it really enjoyable to knit, but it's not overpowering in terms of the, the kind of surface texture and pattern. So yeah, I've got two samples there. Um, the pink one needs a block, so it's not quite finished. Um, so they'll, yeah, I'm pretty sure they'll come out to be the same side off, size after it's blocked out. Um, and it's, yeah, it's hard not to speak too much about that, but I will talk more about that um, in January. So two cowls and a flannel. Um, the other thing that I've been working on are my third pair of Christmas socks. So um, I knit two pairs of fairy light socks here, um, one for me, one for a gift. And then I knit a third pair of Christmas socks. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, I finished them. Um, the very strict amongst you guys may disagree because as you can see I haven't grafted the toe or sewn in the ends. I made my partner sew in three ends and um, took, he took quite a lot of persuasion but he didn't do a bad job at all. Um, but I can only persuade him to do three ends unfortunately and there's quite a lot more but at least three were ticked off. Um, so yeah as far as I'm concerned these are finished and I've got a couple of journeys um, lined up over the next couple of days on the way to visit various different bits of family who live in different parts of London. The um, thing about London is that <laughs> like a distance of say seven miles is considered huge. Um, a distance of 12 miles is considered enormous um, which is kind of mad and I live in outer London and um, people are like Enormously, a lot of people are quite patronising about where I live, if I'm honest with you, because it's not in a very cool area. Um, <laughs> but I've never been very cool, what can you say? Um, and anyway, all that means is that you end up doing a lot of travelling and commuting and you get quite used to crossing distances. But yeah, to the average person, well, to be honest with you, even my mum, I think I live two miles away from my mum and I don't see her very much. Um, and that's because of the situation of transport. Transport tends to go in and out of the city and there's not very much transport that works that that well locally or kind of across it's always kind of up and down um, and so yeah even two miles can be can be a great distance in London um, so anyway got all of that that traveling to do in London um, and so hopefully I will um, finish those off over the Christmas period and I actually want to keep them for myself but I think I'm going to be a nice person and wrap them up and make my, well, I was going to say give them to my partner for Christmas, but then I was simultaneously saying make my partner wear them. 
<laughs> so it's a little bit, I don't know, he's, he's a really, really enthusiastic recipient of hand knits, so it's not like and he's been coerced in any way, but yeah, anyway. Um, so I did those, and then I'll probably have enough yarn left over to knit a second pair, um, and that's because I've been quite economical with the main striped um, yarn, which is West Yorkshire Spinners and Hollyberry. It's an old Christmas colour um, range that, yeah, it's from a couple of years ago. And interestingly, I, whenever I saw it in the shops, I've seen it in the shops for quite a few years, I never really fancied it. But after I knit the fairy lights, <laughs> I just I just wanted to have it so that I had um, a pair, like a more kitsch pair of Christmas socks and a more traditional pair. Um, in terms of the colouring and so I got it even though I was I didn't think that I liked it that much but something totally changed as I was knitting and I really enjoyed it and I felt like the stripes it felt really like 70s and um, bit retro and just I liked the fact that there's an orange and a red right next to each other and that tonally it fits in really well and yeah, I just really enjoyed the process of knitting these socks, actually much more than the, if I do it again, very light. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I might give it a little bit of a rest for Christmas socks for the moment, but then again, um, yeah, I don't have, I've got lots of play in sock yarn and I would love to acquire some more interesting sock yarn um, coming up because I kind of go through stages of my knitting, either I'll make loads of boring plain basic stuff and then I'll get really sick of it even though it's so useful for every day and then I'll switch to lots of crazy crazy bright stuff that all just clashes and goes mad so it's always very one to the next and whilst we're on the subject of crazy bright stuff that clashes um i wasn't actually very happy about the situation of my own whip along list and um i really just wanted to get through some more projects especially get rid of a couple of old projects um there's a couple of old sweater cast ons that i just haven't managed to get to and that's because i was busy like knitting up multiple samples of patterns those and the socks and writing up patterns and all of the rest of it mm. So those have continued to be languishing whips. But the two sweater cast-ons from this year, I, I really would love to tackle. And I am very glad that I managed to finish knitting up the body of my Caterpillar jumper. Oh, I think it's that way around. The body, and then yesterday I seamed the shoulders and did the collar. Um, now Caterpillar, something that I started a couple of months ago, maybe in the summer, quite spontaneously, um, probably shouldn't have cast it on. <sighs> um, <laughs> it was basically a scrap jumper because I was literally having trouble closing the drawer that all of my yarn was living in. And this is constantly a battle, like I would love my yarn stash to only fit one drawer but it just doesn't seem to be realistic and I've had years where I have spent all year being obsessed with getting rid of my stash and it's felt a bit stressful. Um, yeah, and like I've been very boring and my friend Ellie will know all about this and I've been like, no, I can't buy anything, I can't buy anything. And to be honest with you, it's, it's a good attitude to have when you don't have very much disposable income. Um, but I feel like I, I just kept playing catch up with, with yarn that I had that I'd bought because someone had given it to me, it was on sale, I'd bought it for a project and hadn't got around to casting it on and then bought something else and it just felt like this relentless endless cycle and to some extent I'm still in that endless cycle um, because I know for a fact that I've got two whips that I haven't managed to touch through the whip along, a green one and a white one and I've got yarn for one sweater that is ready to go um i've got two more whips here so that's five and then i've got yarn that i bought to make a shawl but then i've decided that i prefer it as a cardigan so i need to actually buy more of it um a larger quantity so that's like six garments that i could deal with and there's something else that i want to cast on that i know what yarn i'd like just haven't decided the color and the fact that i haven't decided the color means i haven't bought it and yeah, it's like relentless and um, it's sort of part of this desire to make, surrounding yourself with beautiful materials, things that are tactile, things that we love, how the, how the 
object of materials have been made as well, like yarn as an object. Um, and I think overall I just, I need to have more of a mindset shift. I mean, I, I feel like I'm already quite strict on myself and to an extent I'm already, well, I'm quite hard on myself. My, my boyfriend tells me that I'm really hard on myself about a lot of things, sort of achievement and all of that kind of thing. Mm. But yeah, kind of just trying to get to a mindset shift where I just buy something and then I make it rather than having a kind of a hoard and a stash. And some people enjoy having a stash or a hoard. And um, oh, there was an episode of the Kamabornia, the Swedish podcast, knitting podcast, where she was talking about how she didn't like the word stash and she preferred to call it her, her jewel cave or her treasure box or something like that, referring to her materials. Um, but I I don't feel that way about it. Um, I understand where she's coming from, and I and I appreciate where she's coming from. Um, but that that is not that is not my my perspective. And I like the word stash because I find it really funny, um, <laughs> which is sort of the case with a lot of um, knitting terminology that has arisen over the kind of well first two decades of the twenty first century um, sort of through things like the Debbie Stoller Stitch and Bitch book I find it quite tongue in cheek um, and I meant I, was to I talked about the Stitch and Bitch book on my um, recent video about uh, taking your knitting to the next level when I mentioned the kind of resources that I learned to knit with um, well yeah quite a while ago now <laughs> and um I think when you, yeah, when you think of um, a stash, it's associated with two things, obviously. One, the first thing um, that's very bucolic, um, well, at least appears bucolic on the surface, is squirrels. Now, long-term followers will know my relationship with squirrels. <coughs> yeah, they're not here right now. Constantly in a battle with the squirrels constantly in the battle with the squirrels that come into my garden and just make a mess. They make a mess, they make a mess. Uh, less said about that, the better. And it's the idea of the squirrels kind of, um, yeah, hoarding, stashing all of the nuts off the trees and make, digging, a, digging a hole in the ground and burying them and, and keeping them all hidden so that they can sit there and gleefully eat them all winter, or as is the case in my garden, peel the figs and spit the peel all over the garden and pluck the ripe pears out of the neighbour's pear tree, take one bite and throw the pear on the floor. Not a fan of squirrels. Anyway, so that's the, um, yeah, that's the naturalistic side of stashing. And, you know, like Mother Nature, nature is cruel. <laughs> As anyone who's watched any kind of David Attenborough nature documentary will know, it's not all it's not all rosy out there for the animals. Um, but the second type of stash that you'll know about is if you have friends that enjoy certain types of homegrown herbs. Let's leave it at that. That's also known as a stash. <laughs> If you know what I mean, you know what I mean. And if you don't know what I mean, let's move swiftly on. But the point is, I find stash an amusing word. It's funny. Um, but to me, having too many excess materials represents sort of un, un, unused potential. Um, and I've talked about this before in standalone videos. So yeah just trying to think about shifting my mindset focusing on what i'm making immediately and to a certain extent i think that's why some projects in or rather in the whip along um, initiative a lot of people have said that they have finished like new cast on projects straight away and still haven't managed to get finish up their old projects and it's been the same for me i've had new cast on like the socks the cows the funnels i've just started it and finished it the end. And I would really love that approach to be given to many more of my knitting projects as well as my craft materials. So we'll we'll keep having that aim in mind and just see how it goes over the next year. So oh that was all very long-winded. So yeah, um so I was opening the drawer, all the yarn fell out, I combined all of the colours and decided to cast on this. Um I've got it here caterpillar design from an old back issue of Rowan which was designed by Kay Fassett. Now isn't that gorgeous? Like talk about bucolic. So stunning. 
Um, however, when I looked up this pattern on Ravelry, I discovered that there were some people who had knit the pattern using their recommended yarns. And I basically discovered that this photo was taken with a lighting filter. Um, and it looks very moody and dreamy, but the recommended yarns were coming out really like acid bright, like um, like the Very Hungry Caterpillar or a tube of Rowan fruit fruit tree fruit twist. There's like a there was like a a stick of like chewy jelly sweets um, advertised in the UK in the like early early thousands. That's sort of kind of like a rainbow, um, and that wasn't really the feeling that I wanted. And I had loads of stash yarn anyway, so I decided not to bother to even attempt to follow the striping sequence, but instead just to sort of feel like I was knitting in a way that was inspired by K Facet. So sort of painting with yarns and, and experimenting with texture. So I've got the two sleeves that I did quite a while ago, sort of pretend that I'm putting them on here. And then I've got the body and the cowl neck. Now, unfortunately, I'm going to have to redo the cast off of the polar neck um, because it's come out too tight. And yeah, I'll just have to try a different bind off method. And I've now got this, it's not really gonna work. Um, but I'm wondering if it's actually coming out too long. So once I've sewn it up, I'm considering that it might actually be better if I cut the bottom off. I know after all that, just cut the bottom off um, and then knit some ribbing and have it more as a mad cropped jumper or just leave it really long and have it as a like slobbing at home, pretending to be an artist from the 1930s kind of jumper, kind of like uh, in I Capture the Castle, the book by Dodie Smith that was turned into a movie. This is what I pretend myself um, <laughs> in. Uh, you know, especially if you imagine like a really long jumper worn with like a pleated tweed skirt and then a pair of heeled brogues, I would feel very like a mad English aristocrat living in a crumbling castle. Um, no, aristocrat, I think I mean bohemian, mad bohemian upper class English people. Um, <laughs> so that's Caterpillar. It'd be a shame to have cut the bottom off, but it would be more of a shame for it not to be wearable. And surprisingly, I still got absolutely, um, where is it? Oh, the bag's dropped off over there. I've still got loads of yarn left, so I need to think of another kind of scrap jumper project to make for myself um, or fob off on my sister <laughs> um, with with all of those, especially because I, I just love the colours. Um, I think it's, it's really fun. And yeah, fingers crossed I'll be able to finish off the sewing and piecing and, and just figure out the solutions. Hopefully I will get that all done by the end of the year, the end of the whip along. And hopefully I will also get done this kind of pile of orange stuff. Um, I'm not going to get it out, but it's basically <laughs> the body of a garment and two sleeves. And I need to connect them up and knit the yoke, which is not an insignificant amount of knitting. And I'm just hoping that I'm going to get some time over the next week or so um, before the end of the whip along to get those two done. And then I'll be I'll be quite pleased, actually, because that is quite a lot of stuff done. Um, and then probably leave the languishing whips on the back burner, the two sweater projects that I mentioned. And then there's also um, two summer projects, which I'll probably do when it comes close to the summer. So not bad at all, as far as I am concerned. So there's no mending um, for this episode. Just shove all of that back in the basket. Um, but there is quite a bit of sewing. Um, so here I've got two pairs of pyjama bottoms. Um, one for me and one for my partner. The one for me is um, almost done. And uh, it's made out of this really gorgeous cat fabric that is a now discontinued print by Cotton and Steel um, and it's a bit of a saga and I, I might go into more detail about that next time because this video is getting quite long but it, it's trimmed in this beautiful um, cotton lawn uh, kind of flowers with a white leaf background that's also in navy so it's sort of dots and flowers which is really fun so yeah I'll talk about this more next time because there's quite a lot to say about 
this pair of pyjama bottoms, not all good. Uh, and then hopefully what's going to be a bit more successful is this um, pair of pyjama bottoms using a self-drafted pattern. Um, yeah, which is in burgundy check, which is in cotton. And I cut these out last night. Um, and if you watched Vlogmas, you would have caught the start of me trying to cut these out. And I just sewed these up over a couple of hours this morning. I came up with a new way of doing pockets um, that's based on a tailored um, side entry pocket construction but I took it one step further and I married it up with a way of finishing pockets um, inspired by kind of good quality ready, ready to wear trousers. Um, so I was quite pleased with that little bit of innovation and means that the pockets sit really nicely, although they're slightly narrow, but um, I think these are for my partner and I think if the pockets are too big, he'll just end up keeping his whole life in the pockets and they'll end up wearing out. So I am being a little bit manipulative and cutting slightly too small pockets uh, in the hopes that they won't be used as a handbag. <laughs> Should we leave it at that? Let's leave it at that. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's those. And they are, they're almost done. I basically sewed as far as I could get until I had to get the iron out, which I didn't fancy doing. And then I put them aside to have a little, a little break. Um, so yeah, that's not too bad. I've just got to fold down the top in order to make a little um, rolled hems and I'll insert some elastic there, then I'll have to stick him in them and check what length he likes them to be, because I basically adapted a shorts pattern. And I did that in a bit of a lackadaisical way in that I drafted the alterations directly onto the fabric and kind of freehand sort of drew and, and cut them. And that's just because I've made a lot of pairs of trousers in the past, um, in a past life studying uh, historical tailoring. So I knew what shape it had to be. I knew what they needed to be. I knew how I how I'd have to alter them you know I knew that I wanted to raise the back a little bit higher and as I did I cut them out I cut it out very roughly so it's looking a little bit pointy um, and it should be more of a beautiful curve but again I'll just freehand go in there and trim that and um I'll just say that that is something that is quite new this sort of freehand drafting and cutting onto fabric especially checked fabric that's very very new to me that's something that has just happened um, this year but I have been sewing um, both personally and professionally and um, kind of academically as well uh, for, for a very long time and for years and years I would hear about the idea of tailors drafting patterns directly onto the cloth and just cutting it out and I found that really intimidating and couldn't really understand why but now I do. Um, now that I've got to a bit of a further level, I can see why it is that they would do that. Long story short, it's in order to save time. And it also goes back to, you know, it re relates to making things bespoke for people. So you can make very particular alterations directly on the cloth. You don't need to draw out a separate pattern for that. That takes a lot of time drawing out tracing out patterns and stuff um, and then you have the fitting so you can you can fiddle with it and make it really perfect at the fitting as well um, yeah <laughs> that's basically it and I've found myself kind of quite naturally falling into that situation um, but yeah as I said the idea of like taking a piece of tailor's chalk and just drawing onto fabric and then just cutting it out like in the past that would have completely terrified me and I would have had to you know use my French curve and draw out the most beautiful lines and you know connect all the dots and measure and remeasure. whereas now I have a very highly trained eye I know what the seam allowance should be half an inch or an inch I can just cut and I'll know what the seam allowance is it is and I will need to measure that so um, practice makes perfect. I'm still not perfect. I'm, I'm quite casual about it, I think, and less sort of um, worried, but maybe that comes with confidence as well. So yeah, hopefully I'll have a chance to um, hem these up uh, later on, stick them in them, do the, do the bottom cuffs as well, and then I will wrap these up and give them to him for Christmas, <laughs> even though he's already seen them. So yeah, that's all the sewing. So um, I'm going to start to wrap up this video with uh, conversational threads. Um, recently I purchased this pamphlet or zine 
um, which has been put out by, um, her name is Meg, um, and she has a pseudonym called Mrs M, Mrs M's Curiosity Cabinet, and she has an audio podcast, and I discovered her um, through someone talking about this pamphlet on Instagram, and I purchased it. Um, um, basically what it is is three pieces of prose um, kind of ruminating about different aspects of making and, and it's been written down in a very conversational style. Um, she, calls, she calls these uh, essays, I think, um, but it's not um, an essay in an academic way. I think it's more um, reflective, reflective prose as opposed to kind of a constructed argument which sort of systematically goes through a lot of points and it's sort of written to be extremely persuasive. I think she does write persuasively, um, but I would pers I, I, I understand her writing as reflective prose. And yeah, it's written in a very conversational style. You could imagine her reading this out or, or speaking it. And um, so, like I said, she does have a audio podcast as well, um, which, you know, if that is your thing, please do check that out. Um, personally, I find audio podcasts um, are not something that I am currently listening to a lot now. Um, personally, at the moment, I'm more into video podcasts. So, you know, whatever floats your boat. And I really enjoyed this because she has this one piece is called Knitting is My Yoga Unraveled in which she talks a little bit about flow state which is a kind of um, psychology term I guess but basically the flow state is this this state of mind that you might get into where you become hyper focused on something and you have the feeling that you, you're only concentrating on the task that's at hand and sort of time and the worries of everyday life kind of fall away and it, and it allows you to um, make incredible work and I would personally describe flow state as what I enter into when I do very long practice sessions at the keyboard or previously when I played the cello um, and not for me, um, I think when I was learning tailoring, that, that probably was a flow state as well because it's something that completely absorbed your attention uh, and she's talking about comparing uh, talking about yoga as a flow state and as a way that sort of involves the concentration of body and mind together and comparing that to knitting which has historically been a bit more of a social activity um, kind of without wanting to give too much away so I, I, I really enjoyed this um, essay although it had the slightly disruptive um, consequence of when I went to a yoga class I then started thinking about whether or not yoga was a flow state and then that kind of interrupted me <laughs> that thought kind of interrupted my yoga practice of that day um, so that was ironic unintended consequence I'm sure but I guess it was something that I'd taken for granted. I'd never thought about yoga as a flow state in that way because flow is, I've done a, I've done a couple of workshops about it, um, especially in terms of teaching, um, sort of uh, getting students to achieve their full, full potential and get into flow state kind of really helps that in creative practices. Um, but I hadn't really thought about applying it to myself, which is kind of ironic. So I enjoyed that. Um, so yeah, I know that she's running low of these pamphlets in terms of the stock, so you have to see where she's at with that. Um, but what I wanted to talk about more was she um, has an essay where she talks a lot about waste and what that means in terms of like materiality and sustainability, um, in terms of sort of being kinder to the environment. and. I read the essay about waste um, at a really crucial time because basically a few weeks ago I made some Christmas puddings and I gave them to my grandma because she's got a much bigger kitchen to me and I asked her to store them in a cool dark place and feed them with alcohol, brandy. And I went last week into the kitchen, opened them up to have a look at them and they had all gone off. They had a really horrible smell and they just didn't quite look right and so we threw them all away and it was big in many ways it was a big waste of resources you know the ingredients that had gone in we did put them in the compost so there's that but also it was the time because I'd literally spent all 
day making these Christmas puddings and I talked about it even on the podcast a few weeks ago and you know use figs from my garden and yada 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 and we just, me and my grandma just looked at each other and went oh well that's that <laughs> <laughs> they're gone and I told my aunt because they'd actually intended to give them away as Christmas gifts one to my aunt she was really disappointed um and I sort of just thought I'm not a cook or a chef or a pastry maker I'm not that great at preparing food there's times where I've enjoyed it and been more invested in it and now it's sort of one of those things that has to give uh along with things like mopping the floor because I've got a million and one things to do so yeah, it's not my specialism. I'm better at knitting socks and making tailored trousers and, and suits and so on. I can't be good at everything um, when it comes to domestic tasks. Um, and, I, and then I read this essay. It sort of arrived in the post that day. And I read this essay about her take on waste and how she tries to salvage things as much as possible. She'll unravel her jumpers and unpick her twirls and kind of handmade clothes. Ooh. Well, the sun's really coming out now. Um, good thing that this is coming to a close. Waste is, is necessary, I guess, in order to, to learn and to try things out. Um, and the way that she, she tries her best to think about waste is something that you can utilise and move on for, um, either as a lesson, kind of conceptually or physically. And then again, there's the Christmas puddings going in the compost piles. So at least they are breaking down and will end up feeding my plants, feeding my garden um, at some point again. So um, that's sort of my summary on this zine and how it was really helpful to me. Um, you know, it really it arrived at home at, at a really helpful moment and stopped me being too regretful because I think in the past I might have been quite well, much, much, much sadder about um, the fact that I had spent a whole day baking things intended as gifts and then they had spoiled, essentially. Um, but I guess the older that I get, the more that I come to accept how much is beyond our control and kind of come to terms with that, become okay with it. Um, so I think reading these essays in this style, kind of very lyrical and thoughtful and a little bit slow, although I, I, I've got very fast reading speed so I did zip through them, um, was something that I, I really enjoyed. And also I've been saying for a while that I would like to put some of my, create, my own creative and reflective writing into a zine format and I think um, having this out there with you know mostly text and a few black and white photos made me feel like there is um, space for what I want to do whereas before I'd been quite insecure about it and yeah I've had a lot of ideas I've mentioned it to you guys some of you guys have written back to me and said you'd be interested in it and that's been very encouraging and I think it is going to be something that I do um, in 2020 put out the written word um, on paper kind of inspired by this pamphlet but as usual doing things very much in my own way so watch this space um, just before I finish, whilst I was making those Christmas puddings, I also did a few other Christmassy tasks. And although I had to throw away three figgy puddings, I am delighted to say that it wasn't all bad and I had some real success. So this is spiced cherry vodka. And a big shout out now to Renee, um, who I believe lives in rural New York State. And her username is Coffee with Room for Cream on um, Instagram. And Renee's been very, very supportive of Crimson Endeavours right ever since the beginning. I don't know how you found me um, in the beginning, but right since the beginning, Renee has been there cheering me on. And one of the things that she cheered me on was in the summer, I think it was in July, I discovered that there's a cherry orchard um, in my local park in the foraging zone. And I went and picked lots of cherries and I didn't know what to do with them, so I just shoved them in the freezer. And Renee Renee gave me the idea to macerate the cherries in vodka and at the beginning of December I finally did it. I got the frozen cherries out of the freezer, mixed it in with half a bottle of vodka, um, some cinnamon bark, star anise uh, and lemon peel and a little bit of sugar as well and I let them soak for about three weeks and then we, you can see hopefully what an amazing colour it's gone. 
it's really taken on this dark, dark, dark cherry red. And it went down very, very well at a recent mulled wine party that I had chez moi with my friends. Um, and I think that some of the cherries have absorbed actually quite a lot of the vodka, so I didn't serve the cherries themselves. Um, it's slightly medicinal and very reminiscent of a Portuguese liqueur called Ginginha. Um, so that was, that was great. We loved it. I had to ration it out. So there's a little bit left. Sun's totally blowing me out, so I'll come back here. Um, yeah, there's a little bit left and I'm, I'm actually going to top it up with a bit more vodka and just hope that um, it's not too diluted and just leave it in there for a little bit longer. But next summer, when the cherries come back out next summer, it's definitely going to be cherry vodka making production at my place. And I'm super excited about that. So thank you, Renee, for the suggestion. Um, it was a great one. <laughs> So that's everything for now. The sun has just hit a really low angle and is completely washing me out. And so I'm going to wrap up this video, the last podcast episode of 2019. Thank you so much for joining me on my mad crimson journey. <laughs> over this year. It's been really great to have you. Um, I hope that whatever you're getting up to, um, you're enjoying yourself. Uh, and if not, that you're managing to take a little bit of time out and enjoy some making and crafts. Take care of yourself and see you very soon.